also meant to reassure you, really, because I had a real fear about it. Uh, they weren't very patronising, they were helpful, and I will give you an example of how they were helpful in a bit. And what they say is that it's meant to be a discussion with a senior colleague as if you're a first aid consultant. And they do actually treat you like that in the exam. They don't walk in and pile the pressure on. It's not like the MRCS where you get handed stuff. What do you think this is? What? You know, it is actually a two-way conversation, and they treat you with more respect than I thought I'd get treated with, <laughs> to be honest. Um, the questions, they build up through the difficulty. So like University Challenge, you get your start at the 10. And then they work up, common things are common. They didn't, to be honest, ask a lot about evidence. If I knew it, I tried to work it into my answers, but I didn't only once in my whole two days did someone say to me, what's the evidence behind that? Um, so, know it, but it's, it wasn't as prominent as I thought it would be. Make sure you give structured responses and don't try and wing it. I did with one question, and he just rocked back in his chair, grinned at me. He knew I was trying to wing it. I knew I was trying to wing it, so I just said, I don't know. And we moved on to the next question. But these guys are really experienced. They've seen it, it all before. You're not going to be the first one to blag it. So, critical care and emergency surgery. Uh, 15 minutes each, and within that 15 minutes, they generally try and get three, three scenarios. So essentially, you've only got five minutes on a scenario. They'll start you off basic and build you up as quickly or as slowly as they need to. So critical care incre includes trauma. So from my practice viva, the scenario that I got more or less was about splenic trauma. And the hint that I got from the senior examiner was that you talk to them, and, and I never thought about doing this. It was about, as I'm walking to the trauma call, I will be thinking about, and I did that in the exam, and they were like, all oh, right, and so rather than just saying, oh, it's a splenic trauma, I'm going to need to do X, Y, and Z, you say, well, if they, the scenario is you've been called to resource, as I'm on my way down to resource, what I will be thinking about is, uh, if you want to do that, I did, I saw it, they seem to like it, ABC, again, make sure you get your ABCs in, um, in the history you're expecting this, or you want to know on examination, my findings would be and my investigations would be. So try and structure your answer. And then they took it down the route of management, what would be my management. Talked about radiological embolization, the patient was too unstable, so they led me down the track of surgery. Talked about the blood supply to the spleen and the ligamentous attachments. Having said there's not a lot of anatomy in it, but that was pretty much all the anatomy I got. And then went down the line of post-op care. Um, what vaccines would you give them, what organisms are you trying to stop them, and what other precautions would you take, things like giving them a card and tell them, giving them a course of penicillin and things like that. So that's the sort of level of stuff you're going to get, that's the sort of the way it's going to happen. Another thing in my practice viva, complications of massive transfusions, things like that. Not stuff you'd ordinarily think about. Um, emergency surgeon, surgery component was a Basically, someone with left iliac fossa pain and a temperature. You had to go through your differential diagnosis, what imaging. It turned out to be a perforated diverticular disease. How would you manage it? And because I knew, I was really proud of myself, I knew about the Hinchy classification. So I said the Hinchy classification and stopped. And he took the bait and went, oh, tell me about the Hinchy classification. So that wasted about a minute or five minutes. So that was great. And then also, with my lower GI... Practice five, uh, the guy who was sort of talking, or well, one of the other practice fives I'd had, tell me about this paper from Winter at Al about laparoscopic washouts and stuff. <coughs> so I thought I'd throw that in there as well. And that was the only bit of evidence that I offered or was asked for in my whole Viva day. Um, so if you know it, work it in. I think uh, Mike spoke about this. Another common one is bile leak post lap coli. You're a general consultant on call at night, you get called because there's bile in the drain, post a lap coli. One thing, again, just saying stuff that you would take as red, but actually you just don't vocalise because it, you think it's obvious. You actually say, I would go to the notes, look through the notes, read the op notes. Now you sort of take that as red because it's what you do all the time, you do it automatically, but just make sure you sort of verbalise that. Just quickly, general and subspecialty, dysphagia history examination, 
groin lumps, common stuff common, femoral hernia, what approach should you use, would you use a mesh or not, what are the complications, acute limb ischemia, history examination based around the six P's, and uh, tell me about sources of emboli, how would you investigate for that. So common stuff, and it not particularly high brow at that point. Just a couple of scenarios from my actual Viva, which I hope when this goes on YouTube, I won't get struck off for telling you about. It will be disappointing when you go through these exams if you don't get some what I called old school randomness. That, oh, you're wearing a tie with a fish on it, tell me about. So I got some old school randomness as well. Why don't horses get varicose veins? <laughs> Apparently it's because they stand on four legs rather than two. And so they don't have a column of hydrostatic pressure. But yeah, so you get your old school randomness. And the last thing is about helpfulness. And this is what I call my Tourette's moment in the exam when I was under pressure. Some of you already know about this. I essentially got a scenario which was back pain and cardiovascular collapse. And I said, you would have to assume this was a ruptured AAA. I'm very proud of myself. And then they said, well, what are your differential diagnoses? And I said, I would like to rule out pancreatitis by checking an amylase. Anyway, the amylase is very mildly elevated, but not diagnostic. What else could it be? The ischemic gut, obviously, I said. What else could cause a mildly elevated amylase, he said. So at this moment, rather than coming out with perforation, I went into this general panic, <laughs> which you will at some point, and they said, and he was looking at me and I was looking at him, and I thought, well, I've got to say something, and he said, well, what else could cause it? <laughs> <laughs> so I went, mumps. <laughs> so there was general hysterical laughter. On both sides of the table, he looked at me, said calm down, and got me back on track, and everything was fine again. So when you have your Tourette's moment, don't think, oh, it's all over. Like I say, they've seen it all before. If you do say months for raised amylase as your third differential diagnosis, it's not a disaster. And they are helpful. So, on to the clinicals. Be nice, be oh, it's obvious stuff. Be nice, be professional, be polite. When you examine the patient, leave them back as you found them. Um, you do have to take your jackets off. You do have to roll up your sleeves. Some people turned up without a tie on. I must say, I turned up with a tie on and tucked it in. Um, you'll probably get guidance. And don't forget the alcohol gel. It is on a ward. You've got a gel on the way in. You've got a gel between each patient and all of that. Take direction from what they tell you, and what I mean by that is because, again, you generally try and get through six cases in half an hour, so they'll give you very specific and very straightforward instruction. Take a history, examine the left leg, inspect the abdomen. Don't start going, oh, I think I'll check to see if they've got clubbing and spider nevi and all of this business, and examine for palmar erythema and leukonychia and all that. Sort of obviously past that point now. So like I say, two sessions of 30 minutes, general, subspecialty, approximately six cases in each. Again, if you've not nominated a subspecialty, you'll get general and general. And like the discussion with your senior colleague, this is, are you safe to be a day one consultant? This is not, we're going to try and catch you out with something complex. <coughs> we're going to see whether you get this really complicated thing. Are you sensible? Are you safe? And that's their approach. And that's the approach they're meant to take, and it very much was. Common stuff is common. Post-op stuff, abdomens, amputations, breasts, legs, battle-scarred abdomens. You're going to look at stomas. Um, stable chronic conditions, hernias, varicose veins, gallstones, claudication, stuff like that. But you will end up in centres where there are specialist interests. You may end up somewhere that likes short gut syndrome. So you've got people with really scarred abdomens and TPN lines in. You may end up somewhere that has a specialty, I don't know, some funny pseudomyxometer or whatever it is. You know, so just be aware that if you are going to a certain centre, is there, you know, you might put yourself a step ahead. 
is there anything these people deal with that might pitch up that's a stable chronic thing that's a little bit more complex? After the initial instruction that you get, that will trigger a discussion to your next step or next stage. So they'll ask you to examine a patient, and then you'll go off and have a discussion about, say, the investigation and management of gastroesophageal reflux. How would you work someone up for a fund application? You'll look at a CT scan, and you'll diagnose large bowel obstruction. How would you manage this? You might see someone who, you go and see them, and you can hear this tick, 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 and they've got like a massive incisional hernia, and you can hear that metal valve going. They might ask you about how you pre preoperatively risk assess this patient. Things like that. So this is what I call the you'll be fine slide. Uh, it's my bit of reassurance to you. You've all been generally in busy, good training jobs on a good rotation. So therefore, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because on the intercollegiate website, they've got the pass rates for the last two years. And all of us who are on training numbers, over the last past two years, for section one, the pass rate's about 86%, which is higher than you would think and higher than you're led to believe, because you're absolutely, well, I was absolutely petrified about the whole process, which is why I'm here to try and allay some fears. But you compare that to the non-training grades, and again, for section two is the same. Um, it's not massively difficult. And I know that's easy for me to say. People tell me that before as well, and I went, yeah, whatever. It's easy for them to say they've done it, they're out the other side. It's just personally, but I found it was more personally hard than academically hard. Um, and if I dare say it, I actually found the section two quite enjoyable. It's essentially like a post tape ward round. You get walked round by two consultants, and so treat it as such. It is essentially a post tape ward round. And good luck. And once you've done it, you can have different modes of celebration. You can be like Miss Lachlan and go on a very sophisticated holiday. You can be like Miss Lachlan and have a little party in theatres. Mr. Saha, it would be an understated celebration. A couple of quiet drinks like Mr. Delagrammaticus. Or a couple more. And yet, for some reason, Vams turned into Kenneth Williams. <laughs> a couple more, and you get Mike Lim rubbing himself against another registrar inappropriately. A couple more. And please note that Rav Bora has left the room. <laughs> and if you have a couple more, as per usual, Rav gets involved in a fight. And I'd just like to say that Vam... Rav and Demos have got off very, very lightly, <laughs> thanks to my wife not letting me put in certain photos that I have. So, this is going to be on YouTube. Any questions about the exam? I'm going to come on to the consultant thing. If anyone wants to have a quick break, toilet stop, go because they're late for something. Any questions about the exam or what I've just gone through? No. What's the yes. Yeah. Go on, sorry, I'll come to my one sec. Yeah, go on. You will be paired that the, the panels are very carefully put together. So you go, you don't, you don't sort of, you don't walk in and just file off to random.